If someone is forced to become Muslim, their Islam is actually not considered valid. This is like an encouragement to do this when you're by yourself or in small groups. Discuss this issue. Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? All of these appeals to the intellect and the conscience. La ikraha fi din. That is the basic Quranic teaching regarding the issue of freedom of conscience with regard to accepting religion. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor and my privilege to introduce our speaker. Our speaker is Riaz Ansari. He is coming to us from Malaysia. He was born in Afghanistan to an Afghan father and an American mother. He moved to the U.S. at the age of eight when his parents divorced. He was raised by his non-Muslim mother and at the age of 22 accepted Islam. Mashallah. At the age of 22, he began studying Islam and in the year 1979, moved to Pakistan where he studied for one year. He returned to America from 1980 to 1988, where he married in 1985 and is still married, inshallah, the father of two beautiful Muslim children. In 1988, he moved to Saudi Arabia, to the city of Medina, and studied from 1988 to 1993 graduating from the College of Sharia. He worked in the Washington branch of the Imam Muhammad ibn Saud University as a translator. Riaz Ansari also lived and worked in the UAE for eight years, currently pursuing a master's degree in Usul of Fiqh at the International Islamic University of Malaysia, where he is joining us from. Let me introduce to you Riaz Ansari. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu, nasta'inuhu, nastaghfiruh, wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu fala mudilla lah, wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Topic that I will be speaking about inshallah is freedom of conscience in Islam and I thought to divide it into two issues. The first is entry into Islam and the second is exit from Islam. So does Islam have a policy of forced conversion or compelling people to accept Islam? That's the first issue that I would like to discuss. To start with, we need to look at what is the Qur'an's approach to calling people to belief in Allah and belief in the message that was conveyed to us through Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And without a doubt, the Qur'an calls upon the human being to use his intellect in order to look around him or her at the universe and contemplate the signs of the Creator in the universe. I don't need to go through all those verses with you, but uh, this is a theme that runs through the Qur'an. And likewise, the Qur'an asks the person being addressed to consider the message itself, to use the mind, to use the intellect, to examine the message to see whether it has a divine source or not. Just, you know, the famous example, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُهُ فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Will they not contemplate the Qur'an? If it was from someone other than Allah, there would be in it numerous contradictions. So these are appeals to the intellect to consider the message. And this address and this appeal is directed to every individual. I mean, there's a beautiful verse, says, Ba'da'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, in Surah Saba, verse 46, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَعِذُكُمْ بِوَاحِدًا 
and taqumu lillahi mathna wa furada thumma tatafakkaru say i exhort you to one thing only that you stand for allah standing means to get up so to shake off a person who's sitting is in a sort of a state of torpor so stand up to do what to think qul innama a'udhukum bi wahida an taqumu lillahi mathna wa furada thumma tatafakkaru by ones and twos individually or in pairs i mean this reminds me of when i was a student in college we used to have these like long sessions into the night you know my roommates in college and i where we would discuss you know what is life all about so this is like an encouragement to do this when you're by yourself or in small groups discuss this issue why are we here what is the purpose of life so all of these are appeals to the intellect and the conscience and there's a theme running through the quran also that negates the idea that people should be forced to accept a belief against their will just a few examples of that allah said in surah al-kahf wa qul al-haqq mir rabbikum faman sha'a falyu'min wa man sha'a falyakfur say it is the truth from your lord so whoever wills let him believe and whoever wills let him reject belief this is not an open endorsement of disbelief there's consequences if you believe you'll enter paradise if you disbelieve you'll be uh, plunged into hellfire but it's a matter of choice and in surah yunus allah said he's addressing the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا If your Lord willed, whoever is on the earth, all of them in totality would have believed. So the word man in Arabic is one of, they call it أَدَاتُ uh, الْعُمُومِ It is a means of expressing generality. And then that's further emphasized with kulluhum. So there's no ambiguity here. If your Lord will, every single person on the face of the earth would be a believer. And then Allah goes on to address the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Afa anta tukrihu nasa hatta yakunu mu'minin. Would you then compel people in order that they become believers? So this is a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no. And the verse then goes on to make this further. point wa ma kana li nafsin an tu'mina illa bi idhnillah wa yaj'al ar-rijsa 'ala alladhina yaqilun it is not for any soul to believe except by the permission of allah and he will place defilement upon those who will not use reason so again this is the flip side there's the invitation to use reason and here there is the criticism you know scathing criticism of a person who doesn't use reason that it is a moral deficiency it's moral failing not to use your reason and in a number of verses i mean this is i just mentioned too but this is again it's a theme that runs through the quran again and again and again in different ways and we we know that this is a pattern this is a, a method that allah uses in the quran Uh, that when something is very important it's repeated frequently allah says woman yuti'u ar-rasul faqad ata'a allah woman tawalla fama arsalnaka alayhim hafidha whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed allah and those who turn away we've not sent you over them as a guardian this verse was revealed this is in surah an-nisa verse 80 this verse surah an-nisa is completely medina surah also in ali imran فَإِنْ حَاجُّوكَ فَقُلْ أَسْلَمْتُ وَجْهِ لِلَّهِ وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنْ وَقُلْ لِلَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ وَالْأُمِّيِّينَ أَأَسْلَمْتُمْ فَإِنْ أَسْلَمُوا فَقَدْ اهْتَدَوْا وَإِنْ تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغُ This is in the course of a discussion between the Prophet ﷺ and the people of the book and the discussion also is addressed to uh, the Ummiyyin people who had no book the rest of the arabs so if they argue with you say i have submitted myself to allah 
and so have those who follow me. And say to those who are given the scripture and to the unlearned, have you submitted yourselves? If they submit in Islam, they are rightly guided. But if they turn away, then upon you is only the duty of notification. Again, this is a Medinan surah. And then, of course, the verse that all of us know, لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغيب There's no compulsion in the religion. The right course has become clear from the wrong. Now, it's an interesting point that Pope Benedict, when he gave his speech about Islam, which raised quite a furor, one of the points that he wanted to make was that Islam compels people to accept it. And so he quoted this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, and he said, this was an earlier stage in the development of the message of Islam. When Islam was weak, there was all these talks about freedom of belief. And then when Islam became strong, it was a matter of compulsion. But the fact is that this verse was also revealed in Medina. It was revealed after the Battle of Badr. So the Muslims had demonstrated, or Allah had demonstrated on behalf of the Muslims, that the Muslims were a force to be reckoned with militarily. And the Prophet ﷺ, by the time that this verse was revealed, the vast majority of the pagan Arabs in Medina, they had accepted Islam. Because we know that when the Prophet ﷺ moved to Medina, it was a very mixed society. There were some people who had already accepted Islam from among the people of Medina. There were the emigrants from Mecca. There were pagan Arabs who still remained as pagan Arabs. And there were the Jews divided into a number of different tribes. So when this verse was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ, he was definitely the ruler of the city. That happened when he first moved there. And there was the beginning of the, the struggle with the Jews. The Jews had entered into a written agreement with the Prophet ﷺ. There's a very famous document that Muhammad Hamidullah called the Constitution of Medina. It is like a constitution. It's about a two or three page document in, in Arabic and it details the various rights and obligations of all of the various groups in Medina. So the Jews had entered into these agreements and then there was some power struggles and according to our sources there was an attempted assassination by the Banu Nadir and so that situation was finally resolved with Banu Nadir going into exile and before Islam, society was very interpenetrated. The pagan Arabs, they would sometimes give their children to Jewish families to raise them. Sometimes a woman, she might uh, lose a couple of pregnancies, miscarriages. And so they had this sense that, well, if I dedicate this child to these people, because they're they have a book, they're learned people, they're special people, that this baby will actually, I will be able to deliver it as a live birth. So they had a number of such people, they were the children of people who had become Muslims, but they had been raised with Jewish families. So when the Banu Nadir made their preparations to leave the city, some of these Muslims they wanted their children to stay behind. And the children said, we're going with our co-religionists. I mean, we believe in this. We're Jews. And so they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they wanted to forcibly prevent their, their Jewish children from leaving with the Banu Nadir. And this verse was revealed in connection with that. So although it has a circumstance of revelation, the basic principle in tafsir is that the general wording is operative.
العبرة بعموم اللفظ لا بخصوص السبب The consideration is according to the general wording of the verse not to the particular reason for the revelation and so that is the basic Quranic teaching regarding the issue of freedom of conscience with regard to accepting religion and the prohibition of coercion coercing people to accept it now there are some scholars who went on and in the historical development of Islam they said yeah well this verse has been abrogated now there are some people who said there's like a hundred and some verses that were abrogated by the verse of the sword you know to fight certain people but this is a strange position when you see someone like Pope Benedict saying yeah this is this verse is all fine and well it was it was when the Muslims were weak and when they got strong then it became a different story they actually have Muslim writings, the writings of Muslim scholars that they can refer to to back up that assertion. Ibn Arabi al-Maliki, the, the Mufassir of Qur'an, he took that position. But, you know, this is not correct. And so when we look at, you know, the next natural question that always comes up at this point is, well then, you know, why is it that the Muslims fought their neighbors? The reasons are, the, the legitimate reasons for fighting in Islam, from what I understand, are three. The first is self-defense. The, the verse in Surah Al-Hajj, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا Permission has been given to those who have been fought against to fight, because they have been wrong, they've been oppressed. And this is also made explicit in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Verse 191. Fight in the path of Allah, those who fight you, and do not transgress, because Allah does not love transgressors. So that's one issue. The other issue is to fight in order that the political barriers to peaceful dissemination of the message are removed. وَقَاتِلُوهُمْ حَتَّى لَا تَكُونَ فِتْنَةٌ وَيَكُونَ الدِّينُ لِلَّهِ فَإِنْ إِنْتَهَوْ فَلَا عُدْوَانَ إِلَّا عَلَى الظَّالِمِينَ Fight them until there's no more fitna. And until religion is acknowledged to be for Allah. But if they cease, then there is to be no aggression except against the oppressors. So it's true that there, there is a, a tafsir of fitna here to mean shirk, but this cannot be the consensus opinion. There's a really important event that happened after the, the Muslims conquered sin. Ismail Farooqi referred to it in one of his essays. The Muslim rulers, they gathered the scholars, the eminent scholars. And they said, okay, you know, we've come across these people that are not people that we're familiar with, the Hindus and the Buddhists. So what are we supposed to do with these people? And the consensus of that conference was that leave them to practice their religion as long as they pay the tax to the Muslim state in lieu of military service. And so fitna has many, many meanings. And one of the meanings is persecution. So when there is no freedom to convey the message of Islam, then that becomes a legitimate reason to فَقَاتِلُوا أَئِمَّةَ الْكُفْرُ and he fight the, the leaders of disbelief okay? because they're the ones who are preventing and to get to the leaders you have to fight their, their bodyguards and in, before the bodyguards their armies so in that sense that when the Muslims fought those early wars that they were fighting it to remove oppression it, it's explicit in their message when uh, Rabi ibn Amr or Amr he, the Muslim emissary to the Persians, when the Persian general asked him, why are you people here? He said, 
ابتعثنا الله الله sent us الله raised us up and sent us ليخرج من شاء من عبادة العباد إلى عبادة رب العباد to take whomever he wills from the worship of slaves to the worship of the Lord of slaves ومن ضيق الدنيا إلى سعة الدنيا والآخرة and from the narrowness the constraint of this world to the vastness of this world and the hereafter again there's not a denial of this world it's part of life but it's a small sliver it's like the electromagnetic spectrum you know you have this little narrow band of visible light and the rest of it is unseen so this world we're living in is that is like that a narrow band of dunya which compared to the akhirah is like a drop in the ocean and and then he continued by saying وَمِنْ جَوْرِ الْأَدْيَانِ إِلَىٰ عَدْلِ الْإِسْلَامِ and from the injustice of other religions and systems to the justice of Islam so for instance when the the Muslims they entered certain cities in Palestine and Syria uh, by a truce with the, the citizens of those cities they surrendered to the Muslims they said okay we'll turn over the administration of our city to you and the Muslim said you do that in exchange for the tax the jizya tax and then because the Roman army was gathered to come and repel them from the land and the Muslim armies were divided into many small divisions the Muslims decided that they had to gather their forces in one place so they withdrew from those cities that they had entered and and taken political control of and Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah the great Sahabi one of those ten promised Jannah in his lifetime he was the commander and he ordered that, that the jizya be given back to the inhabitants of those cities and he said you know we took this jizya in lieu of protecting you I mean that's you gave us the money and and our our part of the bargain was to protect you and we're unable to do that therefore we have no right to your money so they said you know you're from a different religion and our co-religionists the Roman army when they come to town they take what they want without asking our money our food our houses our women so that became then a very powerful incentive for those people to accept Islam so that's a very as briefly as I could make it summation of the issue of people entering Islam it's not a it's not something that can happen by force if someone is forced to become Muslim their Islam is actually not considered valid because it's done under coercion and just uh, one final issue with regard to that we should keep this in our mind that when the the people of Mecca began to accept Islam the reaction of the powers that be was persecution and uh, sometimes murder so I mean this was Abu Jahl's response he ended up killing Sumayya we know that for no other reason than, than that she had left his ancestral religion <laughs>